Hello, I'm Dr. David Sistrom, and I am director of the Advanced Cardiopulmonary Exercise Testing Program at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, also the director of the dyspnea clinic, uh, and I'd like to talk to you today about evaluation of the dyspneic patient. Uh, I'll be giving you four cases along the way and some messages that go with those four cases. What I'd like to stress is the type of dyspneic patient I'll be talking about um, will be that that has puzzled the clinician, meaning uh, the time-honored history, physical exam, routine labs have been done. Generally speaking, perhaps at least basic pulmonary function testing has been done, including spirometry, a basic cardiac workup for dyspnea, uh, including uh, when appropriate cardiac stress testing for coronary disease, and uh, usually in 2020, uh, transthoracic cardiac echo. So these will be somewhat esoteric cases, but uh, they exist, and I'd like to put the clinician's antennae up to their existence and how to go about detecting and a little bit on treating them. I have no disclosures. Uh, the first case uh, in all these cases are patients I have seen in the dyspnea clinic whose function at the Brigham is to determine reasons for exercise intolerance uh, when the clinician has been, again, puzzled. So this was a 21-year-old uh, Harvard crew member. Uh, his father actually is a full professor at the medical school, so the heat was turned up a bit to get the answer right here. Uh, he came in with his mom, and uh, what they described to me was about one and a half years of episodic shortness of breath, especially with intense training, especially uh, with uh, rowing on the Charles uh, as part of the Harvard crew team. Um, both the patient and the mom endorsed noisy breathing during the exacerbations, and that was a first uh, historic clue to what might be going on. They also told me that uh, symptoms would clear quite rapidly, uh, and when the patient was in extremis on at least two occasions and EMTs were summoned to the banks of the Charles, uh, they found a totally normal, normal exam when they got there on average five minutes after uh, the patient emerged from the rowing shell. So, uh, and then further uh, pressure on me, the clinician in the dyspnea clinic, uh, the team was headed over to the UK to compete in the Henley Regatta, uh, and he wanted to be better and better quickly. So uh, I started in our pulmonary clinic with some spirometry. Uh, a normal uh, spirogram is shown over on the left. Uh, please remember, for those of you who don't look at a lot of these, this is the expiratory loop. Uh, this is the peak expiratory flow rate measured in liters per second. This is the vital capacity, and this is the inspiratory loop. And what we can see with our patient is that the expiratory loop appeared to be quite normal. This would be quite unusual for obstructive airways disease, including things like asthma that might affect a 21-year-old uh, student. Uh, but then what were, caught our attention here was this flat bottom boat on the inspiratory loop. So this was reproducible. So please, if you do this in investigating this disorder, uh, make certain that the pulmonary function technician uh, reproduces inspiratory loops. And if they all look like that, it should be a real clue to what ails this patient. Uh, so uh, that spirometry led us to refer the patient to an ear, nose, and throat physician in the know um, about uh, something called uh, vocal cord dysfunction. Uh, and that will be uh, the diagnosis here in the end. And here's a cartoon that shows uh, the normal vocal cords uh, during inspiration appropriately abducted. And here is the uh, vocal cord of our patient. Uh, you can see inappropriate apposition of the vocal cords during inspiration. This leads to the noisy breathing, uh, most often termed strider, inspiratory strider. And there's a characteristic opening toward the posterior part of the vocal cord structures called the posterior glottic chink. And this was what was found in our patient. So this is the first um, dyspnea case uh, that might uh, present some diagnostic dilemmas out in the real world. Uh, 
It's uh, also known as laryngeal dyskinesia. It's more often, our case was a male, but it's more often seen in women uh, for unclear reasons, uh, many of them with PTSD. And if they've seen psychiatry, uh, they often carry with them a diagnosis of a conversion reaction. Uh, but it, it, there is a somatic component to this, as we just discussed. Uh, the real problem in its diagnosis is that it can be worsened by things that worsen asthma. Um, so this is vocal cord dysfunction, uh, often masquerading as asthma, dyspnea coming and going, noisy breathing coming and going. Uh, Postnasal drip can worsen it, and uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease can worsen it. The real key here is to elicit a history or a physical finding of inspiratory stridor. That localizes this to the um, extra thoracic trachea, namely the vocal cords. Uh, there may be, uh, not always, but there may be some associated hoarseness that comes and goes with the dyspnea episodes, and that should be a clue. Uh, again, it's often confused with asthma. A real um, helpful test in the pulmonary function lab is a methacholine challenge. So if your patient has perfectly normal uh, spirometry, especially the expiratory flow loop, and you're still considering asthma, you might want to try to provoke a little bit of asthma with a methacholine challenge. Uh, if that's totally negative, uh, that would call into question the diagnosis of asthma and might push you toward vocal cord dysfunction. Uh, arterial blood gases should be normal. Occasionally, these patients end up in the emergency department where one might be drawn. Um, be very unusual to have true oxygen desaturation unless there were something severe like negative pressure pulmonary edema. Uh, spirometry, we've talked about a flattened inspiratory flow volume loop is characteristic. The confirmation, as we've just talked about, is with direct laryngoscopy and maneuvers. So those maneuvers uh, by ENT should include uh, panting, uh, full exhalation, forced inspiration, and occasionally we'll do uh, laryngoscopy with our ENT colleagues uh, after a cardiopulmonary exercise test and try to catch it uh, when it's exercise related. And the characteristic is inappropriate closure of the glottis. Um, the treatment uh, is uh, voice training in a qualified speech lab. And in our case, our patient went off to uh, the speech lab, uh, received biofeedback, and got better after three sessions and was able uh, to control these episodes. Occasionally, um, uh, physicians, especially psychiatry, will use SSRIs with some benefit. All right, so that was case number one. This is cryptogenic dyspnea, uh, in this case, vocal cord dysfunction presenting as asthma. Um, second case, uh, patient WL, another patient I saw in the dyspnea clinic. At the time, he was 51 years old. He was mildly obese, uh, but relatively active before a uh, cardinal uh, event. He was working 35 minutes um, a session on the elliptical at least four days a week. He was on a treadmill and able to do 4.4 miles per hour with a four degree grade, 15 minutes at a time without any dyspnea whatsoever. Over three months before he saw me in the dyspnea clinic, he had a sentinel event. And this he related to hanging an air conditioning unit out of a window. And in doing so, he was leaning over that window uh, with his right axilla draped over the windowsill, and what he noted was the sudden onset of right anterior sharp chest pain, uh, which uh, persisted and radiated to the right shoulder, and new, brand new, shortness of breath. Uh, shortness of breath was present when he attempted to exercise, but also uh, when he would lie flat. So um, further uh, inquiry about the nature of the uh, orthopnea was that it occurred immediately. Immediate orthopnea is a super important uh, historic clue to the nature of the patient's underlying illness here. Uh, this is shortness of breath, not a half an hour after lying down uh, that one might expect in heart failure reduced ejection fraction. Uh, this is immediate orthopnea, which brings to mind something very different. There was a bunch of pertinent negatives, including coughing, wheezing, fever, chills, sweats, and B symptoms of lymphoma, and we'll see why that might be important in a second. 
Uh, we started with a full battery of uh, pulmonary function testing, including the spirometry we alluded to in the last case. In this case, there's a very different pattern. There is expiratory flow limitation, but it appears in a restrictive type pattern. So there are commensurate decreases in the FEV1, the forced expiratory volume in one second, and the vital capacity with a relatively preserved ratio between the two. This is a restrictive pattern rather than an obstructive pattern where you see a uh, disproportionate decrease in the FEV1. Uh, that restriction was confirmed in this case by the body box. This is the plethysmograph that measures the total lung capacity. You can see that uh, there is a significant reduction in the total amount of air in the chest. The diffusing capacity for the carbon monoxide, which is a marker of an, uh, the integrity of the pulmonary capillary bed, was slightly reduced. Uh, 79%. But what one can see is when one corrects that for the alveolar volume, which is measured by a single breath of helium inhalation, uh, was supranormal. This means that all of the reduction, the mild reduction of the capillary bed volume is accounted for by the um, uh, restriction. Uh, if this were an intrinsic problem, of the pulmonary vasculature like pulmonary hypertension, uh, there would be a similar decrease in the DLCO uncorrected and then corrected for the alveolar volume. This was a disconnect. This led us to consider, rather than intrinsic lung disease, uh, restriction due to an extra pulmonary process. Uh, our differential diagnosis was further elucidated by the maximal inspiratory pressure, which is a measure of the inspiratory uh, muscle strength, and this was markedly reduced. So what we've got in the aggregate here is restriction of supranormal ACO or DLCO divided by alveolar volume and respiratory muscle weakness as a cause of extra pulmonary restriction, meaning not intrinsic lung disease. Uh, here's his CT scan with a coronal view, and what we can see is his right hemidiaphragm is way up in the right chest. Uh, further interrogation of that with uh, ultrasound showed uh, that that diaphragm was paretic, did not move, in fact, uh, would move paradoxically during inspiration northward into the chest. Um, further radiographic workup included an MRI of his C-spine. It turned out, uh, even for the lung doc, can see um, severe degenerative uh, joint disease of the vertebral spine in the vicinity of C3 and C4 uh, where the phrenic nerve exits. So uh, what he did when he was hanging the air conditioner uh, was injured his right phrenic nerve. It was a paretic right hemidiaphragm which resulted. So this is respiratory muscle weakness that uh, begat his cryptogenic dyspnea. So a little bit on that, uh, you have to have a high index of suspicion to think about it as a cause for either your acute or your chronic dyspneic patient. A uh, real good clue uh, is immediate orthopnea. So when the patient lies flat, the belly contents want to migrate up into the chest. If the diaphragm uh, or two are weak, uh, then the patient will suffer immediate orthopnea, and this differentiates it from classic orthopnea related to heart disease. Um, usually, it requires both diaphragms to be dysfunctional, but if it's unilateral, as in this case with something else, you can have shortness of breath, and that something else, I think, in him was bit of his panis. So he was a bit overweight, and that represented some diaphragmatic afterload, and that's why uh, he had symptoms. Um, the diagnosis uh, can be suspected by restrictive spirometry confirmed by uh, lung volumes. But if you're really thinking about this, ask the PFT tech to do an upright and supine vital capacity. And if there's more than a 10% fall in the supine position compared to the upright position, it's characteristic of respiratory muscle weakness, and you can confirm that with the maximal inspiratory pressure as we did in this case. The workup should include a CAT scan of the chest with contrast to look at the mediastinum and determine whether there is any mass effect or lymphadenopathy. So in a young individual like this, lymphoma potentially might be in the differential diagnosis, but other 
forms of malignancies as well. Uh, in rare cases, we go to phrenic nerve conduction and diaphragmatic EMGs to confirm uh, that this is the problem. Uh, the treatment for this type of traumatic injury to a phrenic nerve is tincture of time. Um, we uh, ask the patient, uh, and this can occur as in this case with trauma or a frozen phrenic after uh, bypass surgery. Um, weight loss is helpful, meaning it decreases the diaphragmatic afterload and can decrease symptoms. We ask patients to elevate the head of the bed. Uh, we often will complement the workup with an overnight sleep study looking for low breathing episodes. Those are hypopneas rather than apneas. Uh, and if they're there, we will supplement uh, the respiratory muscle effort with BiPAP. Inspiratory muscle training has been used in some cases. And then when we have things like inflammatory phrenic neuropathies or myopathies of the diaphragm, we consider immunotherapy. So our second case uh, was one of cryptogenic dyspnea due to respiratory muscle weakness. The third case I like to give you was a running shoe executive uh, locally uh, who came to us. Uh, of course, he was out there pounding the pavement and at age 61, he had noted a two year decline in his running splits. It took him two more minutes to run a mile uh, on average and the limiting symptom was uh, shortness of breath. And he had undergone uh, the time-honored history physical exam laboratory values um, uh, without any findings. So uh, total uh, pulmonary and cardiac workup, including imaging and echo, they um, were unrevealing. Uh, he had no immediate orthopnea, he had no muscle aches, he had no lightheadedness. So what he ended up having as a result of his workup in the Brigham Dyspnea Clinic was uh, an invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test. And I'd like to introduce you to that because it has given us an answer in these each of these last two cases. So an invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test is a non-invasive variety with a metabolic heart uh, that measures expiratory gases, uh, oxygen, and CO2, and minute ventilation, but adds to it a pulmonary artery catheter placed prior to the test in the cath lab uh, in the internal jugular vein, and then uh, a radial artery catheter as well. And from this combination of things, we get a ton of information, including how sick the patient is. That's generally denoted by a decrease in the maximum oxygen uptake, the VO2 max. We measure uh, blood gases every minute during exercise, both in the arterial side and on the mixed venous side. We measure pressures from all of this, uh, we get a lot of data about what might ail the patient during exercise. Here's a simplified exercise um, diagnostic algorithm. Again, we can determine how sick the patient is with a VO2 max. There is a non-invasive variable uh, that reflects any pulmonary mechanical limit to exercise. I won't get into here today, but if one is uh, trying to sort out, say, heart versus lung disease, and the patient has a bit of emphysema. Uh, this is a non-invasive variable that can be useful uh, and can denote that the lung is the primary limit. The rest of the world, though, is explained uh, largely by the FIC principle. We can confirm uh, that we have a problem with oxygen flux by uh, finding the patient with a low VO2 max and a low anaerobic threshold. Uh, and then we walk down and determine whether these findings are related to a problem with the pump, which we denote a central cardiac limit to exercise. We are directly measuring cardiac output every minute during exercise with the FIC principle, which is the VO2 max time equals the cardiac output times the difference between arterial and mixed venous oxygen content. Um, and if we find a central cardiac limit, meaning the VO2 max is down and the maximum cardiac output is down, we can distinguish between left heart disease, right heart disease, and something else, uh, which I'll come back to in a little bit, uh, which is uh, called preload failure. Uh, on the other side of the equation is a problem with low VO2 max, not due to a peak exercise cardiac output, but rather due to inability to take up and use oxygen normally uh, by the exercising muscle. And that may denote uh, mitochondrial myopathy. I will not talk about that further today, but please know this exists in adults and is a cause of cryptogenic dyspnea. Uh, 
So here are the results for our running shoe executive, a 60 year old man, his mean pulmonary artery pressure here at rest is perfectly normal, about 18 millimeters of mercury, but with exercise rose into a distinctly abnormal range, about 46 millimeters of mercury, the upper limit of normal for him, age adjusted would be about 33. And as important, especially for an elite athlete, is that the pulmonary vascular resistance in blue did not fall normally. For him, that should have fallen down to roughly 100 um, uh, dynes uh, way down here. It did not. So this is uh, precapillary pulmonary hypertension elicited by the stress of exercise. So this is where he lands um, uh, with an elevation at peak exercise of both mean PAP and failure of the pulmonary vascular resistance to fall normally. Uh, we've written about this. This is an older paper, but we've had a lot of uh, subsequent work in this area uh, and it will be in uh, the bibliography at the end. This was kind of our sentinel foray into this area. Uh, I think the contribution of this paper uh, 12 years ago was as follows. We found uh, a cadre of 78 patients over about four years with cryptogenic dyspnea who had as the sole reason for dyspnea uh, an abnormal rise in mean pulmonary artery pressure shown here at peak exercise and the failure of the pulmonary vascular resistance to fall normally. And this is compared to a, a group of normal individuals shown over here uh, and a group of patients with established resting pulmonary hypertension were, who were also studied. Basically, they're worse at rest and they're worse at exercise. So the substantive contribution of this paper was to show that exercise-induced pulmonary arterial hypertension um, affects exercise capacity and is associated with symptoms. And we were able to show this by looking at the VO2 max, which uh, when exercise pulmonary hypertension present only at exercise, not at rest, uh, it was associated with a depressed VO2 max to about two thirds of normal. And that was mediated by an inability to generate a total, totally normal cardiac output expressed as a percent of predicted. So exercise pulmonary hypertension is not just an interesting observation. It affects patient's ability to exercise and is associated with symptoms. Interestingly, there are some early signs of right heart, right ventricular pulmonary vascular uncoupling that's unmasked by exercise, not apparent at rest. So exercise pulmonary arterial hypertension is an entity. It is a cause of unexplained dyspnea. Uh, this advanced or invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test is the only way to determine it's there currently. Uh, so, uh, and what we find when we do that type of testing is that the physiology lands somewhere squarely between a normal pulmonary vascular response and patients with more severe disease present at rest. Uh, there's a lot of work going on uh, on this entity now, including at the Brigham. Uh, we think it's a form of early disease and worth detection and worth treating because uh, uh, catching pulmonary arterial hypertension in an early stage is very likely more readily treatable. Uh, by definition, it's missed by resting transthoracic cardiac echo uh, and resting right heart catheterization. You have to uh, do the stress of exercise to find it. We have one published paper that I've given you in the bibliography of ambrosentin monotherapy. This is an endothelin antagonist um, where we demonstrated that 22 patients with exercise pulmonary hypertension felt better and uh, exercise hemodynamics responded uh, favorably into the normal range on treatment. Uh, but we need bigger clinical trials. That was just a proof of concept. All right, last case is a 23-year-old college student um, who reported to me in the dyspnea clinic at the Brigham that she had been uh, dyspneic as far back as middle school, so um, uh, 10, 15 years previously, uh, noted it during uh, athletic events, including field hockey. And then more recently, she had noted additionally orthostatic lightheadedness and even some occasional syncopal episodes. She had undergone a preliminary workup with autonomic function testing that included a tilt table test on three different occasions. The results were equivocal, so no classic postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Uh, she was, however, treated with mitodrine 
um, but she was requiring it every three hours just to main, maintain uh, stability in the upright position. So uh, quality of life was quite poor. Uh, she had a combination of dyspnea and profound orthostatic intolerance and was having to use Midegrin every three hours. Uh, she had past medical history of mild asthma, but well controlled and some migraines. Um, she might've had some myalgias uh, with exercise in the past. Her physical exam and spirometry were both normal. And here are her results during an invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test. And these are very different from our running shoe executive. Uh, the pulmonary artery pressure is stone cold normal, both at rest and at peak exercise. Uh, but the uh, glaring abnormality is at the level of the right atrial uh, pressures. So they never augment. Normally, they start out at about three millimeters of mercury in the upright position and get up to about nine or 10 millimeters at peak exercise. What we've got is total failure to augment right atrial pressures. Um, in this case, we gave her some fluids and asked her to pedal again with the catheters in place. And you can see the response. Cardiac output went from 62 to 85% and the VO2 max from 44 to 52%. Uh, there was improvement after uh, augmenting intravascular plasma volume with normal saline bolus. This is where she lands. Her VO2 max was quite low. I didn't show you that. Her cardiac output was down in a commensurate fashion. She had no pulmonary hypertension, no left heart failure. What she had was failure to augment right atrial pressures. So this is an entity that we have called preload failure. It's a form of dysautonomia with a lot of overlap with uh, autonomic nervous system dysfunction. So a couple of words on this and we'll close. Um, she started uh, pyridostigmine. This is an off-label uh, comment. Uh, Mestinon is a FDA-approved drug for myasthenia gravis. It works by increasing acetylcholine concentrations in the neural synapse. We think it works at the uh, sympathetic ganglion and augments sympathetic outflow. We've had a lot of luck with it. Uh, her blood pressures were up as a result of introducing pyridostigmine. She uh, was able to come off uh, standing dose mitodrine and then used it PRN for fatigue or lightheadedness. Uh, her quality of life improved dramatically uh, and her uh, dyspnea was markedly reduced. So please remember dysautonomia and maybe get dyspnea. Um, so we've called this preload failure. It's predominantly on young women. There's a huge amount of overlap with MECFS, which is chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, and POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Uh, but patients present with dyspnea in addition to orthostatic lightheadedness and fatigue. Uh, exacerbations happen after stress, and that stress can be almost anything. Uh, very often we hear about a viral prodrome for worsening and even the onset of the disease. Uh, as I said, there's overlap with POTS and even mitochondrial myopathy. Most recently, we have been able to demonstrate that small fiber neuropathy is prevalent in almost half of these cases. That's done by an epidermal skin biopsy, uh, especially stained for the fiber density. Uh, we think the skin is a window into the interior of the individual, and we've married these two. I think uh, neurovascular dysregulation is the cause of dyspnea in many of these cases. Uh, the workup might include autonomic function testing, tests of adrenal function. Uh, if they've ever had a history or family history of DBT or PE, make certain there isn't residual clot impeding uh, venous return. The treatment is augmenting intravascular volume by these uh, uh, conservative measures. Uh, there is some uh, utility in using fluid recortisone and midodrine. We've had a lot of luck, as I said, with uh, pyridostigmine. So um, here are some of the take-home messages that I'd like to leave you. Uh, unexplained dyspnea, uh, it's defined as un- or underexplained dyspnea after a thorough uh, classic history, physical exam, routine labs, full pulmonary function tests, transthoracic cardiac echo, and when appropriate, chest imaging. Um, uh, think about these uh, cryptogenic reasons for dyspnea if you've gone through all of this and the patient is short of breath. So your testing might include, when appropriate, an ENT evaluation for vocal cord dysfunction, a methylcholine challenge to rule out asthma, 
maximal inspiratory pressures if you're thinking about respiratory muscle weakness. And then if you don't have any answers, uh, perhaps consider a referral to uh, a lab like ours for an invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test where you can rule out exercise-induced pulmonary hypertension, heart failure, and preload failure. So I am going to end now with two board questions. Uh, we'll give you a 23-year-old female who presents with 18 months of dyspnea on exertion following an apparent viral syndrome. Her differential diagnosis includes exercise-induced pulmonary arterial hypertension, preload failure, mitochondrial myopathy, the acquired variety in adult, all of the above, or E is just B and C, preload failure, mitochondrial myopathy. We'll give you a moment, and then I'll give you my answer. I would choose B and C. Uh, to our knowledge, there is no link between a viral syndrome and a young woman and exercise PAH. Um, pulmonary hypertension happens in young women. It is a disease of women, um, but not after a viral syndrome. These two do happen after viral syndromes as sentinel illnesses. So uh, the explanation is that preload failure and mitochondrial myopathy, which I didn't spend a lot of time on, uh, can coexist and uh, can be post-infectious, uh, do an autoimmune workup uh, if appropriate. All right. The second board question is another young woman, 18 years old, who presents with two years of dyspnea and some subjective wheezing um, or noisy breathing. The exam in the office is normal. The peak expiratory flow rate, both in the office and given a peak flow meter, patient monitoring it in the field is normal. Uh, short acting beta agonists and a combination of inhaled corticosteroid and a long acting beta agonist haven't helped. This is super common in the cryptogenic cases of um, dyspnea. Uh, patients have been trialed on asthma meds and they haven't worked. So the next step should be increase that asthma controller, perhaps add an anticholinergic. Should you do a CT scan of the chest and irradiate the 18-year-old woman? A transthoracic cardiac echo, um, cardiopulmonary exercise, remember the exam is normal, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, non-invasive or invasive, or should you do a methacholine challenge? Give you a minute there. And my answer would be a methacholine challenge. So the explanation is we've got noisy breathing refract refractory to asthma treatment, consider vocal cord dysfunction. Uh, remember, it can mimic asthma. Exacerbations can be provoked by the very same things that uh, can aggravate asthma. Uh, emotions, exercise, postnasal drip, and GERD. And the methacholine is super useful in ruling out asthma. So if you do that test on a patient off of asthma controllers, that's important, and it's stone cold normal, really the question uh, of di the diagnostic question of asthma should pretty much be put to rest in the negative. Uh, clues are subjective and objective, noisy breathing, especially inspiratory strider, rapid clearing, flattened inspiratory flow volume loop, and, and you can confirm it with your friend in the ENT lab, the treatment is speech therapy. So that's all I have for you, uh, four cases of cryptogenic dyspnea. Um, please remember them, uh, keep them in the back of your mind, and um, when you're scratching your head about what ails the patient, uh, consider the workup I've outlined. And thank you very much.